Okay, so welcome everybody to my channel where I'll be talking about um, rock music mostly. There may be some electronic music as well. But um, first of all, excuse my um, accent uh, and English is not my first language, so please just be um, quite flexible and understanding if you can. And today I'm going to talk about three albums by Deep Purple um, from let's say called Trilogy by um, Rod Evans and um, Nick Simper. So first three studio albums and a couple of additional, um, I'll mention a couple of additional uh, recordings and live performance and so on. And at the end of that video, um, whoever likes uh, vinyl, I would like to present maybe one or two interesting LPs. So I'll be starting with the first album, 1968, Shades of Deep Purple. Um, this album was recorded, as far as I can remember, in May 1968. And I think this is just as a starter for Deep Purple. It's quite a good album. It's maybe not very well known because it's Mark One lineup. And maybe I could talk briefly about the content of the album. So um, we start with instrumental and the address. This is really nice track. I like that. Um, I listened actually this week two or three times every album again after quite a time when I was not in touch with uh, Mark One Deep Purple studio albums. And um, yeah, this is really good opener and we can hear already that um, Richie Blackmore and John Lord are doing good job. Um, no surprise or maybe surprise that it was used in most recent album by Deep Purple uh, called Woosh. Um, so, but I'll come back to that album maybe some other time. Um, so this opener is followed by Hush, their biggest hits in States. Um, it was reached number four in 1968 in States and it was a big hit. And maybe that's why the album uh, was selling much better in the US um, than in the UK or Europe. Um, then it's followed by One More Rainy Day, um, which is quite average track and really like into 60s poppy fashion. Um, it's quite okay, but there's nothing impressive about the track. Then we have Prelude and Happiness as number four, which is um, with like no pause, is just turning into I'm so glad. And because I wrote... Um, 16 years ago, um, reducing Polish language about all the albums. There are some tracks I can't remember so well, so let's just me have a quick look at what I wrote about that. Yeah, so this is just um, really um, John Lord driven track and um, quite impressive work by John. Um, and then I'm so glad. I think it's really poor track on this album, and then um, I think it's just like an album filler, and if it wasn't there at all, nobody would miss that. And then we go ahead, and then we have Mandrake Root. Mandrake Root, which is like um, known as may possibly the first serious riff by Richie in Deep Purple style, as we know. Classic um, Deep Purple. Um, no surprise in when Ian Gillan joined later in 1969. They played it for quite a while. And um, for example, Scandinavian Nights version is, I think, just stunning. Um, and the, the other part of that was played, which was instrumental improvisation by Richie and John by 1974 or 75. Um, with David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes, but it was just instrumental, a bit of that, and it was preceded by Space Trucking. But I think that's the that's a real first Deep Purple track, as, 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 as we know, it's like the essence of Deep Purple and what we recognize as Deep Purple now. So this is um, Mandrake Root. Then I think it's real jam. It's um, a cover version of Help by the Beatles. And I think it's just fabulous, fabulous work. And this is um, 
quite far from the original version. Um, and actually, I quite did find funny when um, when the singer says, um, when I was younger, so much younger than today. So it was 1968. I wonder if Richie listens to that today or anybody from that lineup, what they think when they were 23, 25 years of age singing that lyrics. Um, but anyway, I think it's just outstanding. I think it's the best track on the album and um, um, it's very unique and it's nice that it's so far from the original and as some of you I'm sure you know that um, John and Richie and other guys were really influenced by Vanilla Fudge at that time. Um, the band who really influenced them in early days and here is just example of Vanilla Fudge album if somebody is missing just that style of Mark 1, the purple, I would highly recommend that album and for example Ticket to Ride is just fantastic version as well. So um, okay, so yes all the introduction and even uh, the singing is nice and um, and John Lord is, 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 is just creating fabulous atmosphere in that track. I think it's just outstanding one of the best what Mark 1 produced and recorded. Then it's followed by Love Help Me, and I think it's really average track, there is no point even talking too much about this, which is followed by Hey Joe. Um, I'm sure Richie was, it's well known that he was really influenced by Jimi Hendrix um, and part of Richie's style must have been really a big influence of Jimi Hendrix at that time, and you can hear that in Hey Joe, but again it's very far from the original, which is nice, there's some Latino Mexican or Spanish flavor in in the opening and it just opens for a couple of minutes I think and then um, we can recognize that this is Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix. Um, so this is the last track I think on the album. I won't be discussing any bonus tracks. Um, so I think overall it's a good opener this album for Deep Purple. Um, this is far from what we know and recognize is so far from Mark II or Mark III lineups. The sound is not there yet, especially for Richie. I think really John is really well matured um, keyboard player at the time. Ian Pace is great. Um, two guys on bass and vocal, they just good enough professionals, I think, you know. And Richie, I think, is just still developing his skills, which are quite high as for a 23 year old um, musician at that time. Um, but this is just a good start, and I think it's quite fresh. And there are a couple of high moments on this album. Now we can move to the second one, which is called The Book of Taliesin, or whatever you pronounce that. That's the one with very weird but interesting cover work. Um, and it starts with Listen, Learn, Read On. And I have to just check my notes because there are some tracks I'm so familiar with. From the early days and some of them um, slightly less. Yes, so um, I took a note of that that um, Richie's solo is quite chaotic on this one and this is just very 60s um, poppy style um, track which is not extremely impressive. Um, then it's followed by Ring That Nag that lots of the Purple fans know from Ian Gillen era from early days of Ian Gillen, um, it was just instrumental. Again, Scandinavian Nights, 1970, um, from Sweden. I'm, I'm talking about double CD, not about VHS and video from Denmark, 1972, called Scandinavian Nights as well. So um, yeah, it's quite sophisticated. And at that time, I think it just required high skills on the side of Richie and, and maybe not so much John, who was really well trained, but guitar parts are quite demanding at that time. I think few guitar players could could play that and um, they played that live for a good couple of years and it was up to 20 minutes or something. Along with Space Trucking or Mandrake Road, it was one of the longest tracks they played, I think. And then it kicks in Kentucky Woman, which is, I think, um, some attempt to go along with like Hush and repeat Hush success. 
Apparently it wasn't successful. It's just a nice track and it's quite poppy. And there's night tune and you 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 can uh, hum it sometimes and just sing it. It's it's a good attempt, but just wasn't successful in charts apparently. I think. Then we have number four, which is exposition. That is turning into we can work it out. I think it's by the Beatles cover again. And I think it's just good enough, good enough. But this is not that quality as as held from the first album. It's just, it's positive, it's just, you know, um, among more interesting tracks on the book of Taliesin, but it's not, not exceptional, I would say. Then I think it's The Shield, and I think it's just maybe not rubbish, but it's really mediocre track. So there's no point discussing even, and it's followed by Andem, which is quite interesting. And let me see again into my notes. I'm just <laughs> using help from myself what I have written in Polish language ages ago and I think it was really positive so just let me get back to this yeah it's epic good track with nice um, vocal line oh and it's quite interesting uh, in the background we can hear um, an instrument that was imitating orchestra it was very popular at the time called Mellotron um, it was mostly used by so-called sy symphonic rock bands like Moody Blues, Moody Blues or King Crimson but apparently, which I didn't pay attention much, John Lord used that at that time as well. And then um, the ending track is really very high um, quality and really memorable cover from uh, the Book of Taliesin which is I Can Tina Turner, Riverdale Mountain High and I think it's fabulous. It's stunning with very long um, intro um, and if you don't know what it's going to be you would never guess that it's going to turn in that river deep mountain high track and I think it's really really good work um, maybe it's not as high as um, help on the first album but it's one of the highest points of the book of Taliesin I think overall book of Taliesin is slightly below the level of the first album which is amazing, they recorded those three albums in eight months, I think, May 1968, followed by August, Book of Taliesin, and then January 1969, they recorded this. It's the third um, Deep Purple studio album, called just Deep Purple, with here an Bosch picture in black and white, quite bizarre. Um, I think part of that could be found on Death Can Dance. 4AD label, um, Aeon, A-I-O-N, from 1988 or something like that. But anyway, um, and let's talk about this album now. Same lineup again, because we only discussing today Mark 1 of Deep Purple. So it starts with Chasing Shadows, which is, I think, fabulous track. And especially it's very impressive um, when we pay attention to Ian Pace work, which is quite advanced and really... I think he was working hard and it's quite original. And also John Lord is really doing great in that. Then it's followed by Blind, which I have to turn to my notes again. Excuse me for this. This is just the first recording I'm presenting and um, it, it, I'm sure it's going to be far from being perfect and just let's, it's better I think to do something than nothing, so I'm just starting. Um, yeah, I think it's just uh, the only the only interesting thing about Blind, the second track on the album, is that you can hear, um, I don't know if it's called harpsichord or something, or clavecin, whatever, sorry, <laughs> my, I'm not so, my English is not so good about knowing all the names of the um, classical instruments. But this is, this is nothing special. Then it, uh, it's followed by Lolenia, which is a great track, um, and I think it's really nice tune, and well played, um, but I'm not crazy fan of the vocal from Mark One lineup. So um, it's very sixty tone of that voice, and I'm not surprised that Richie and John were trying to find somebody to replace vocal in a, in the long run. So then we have a weird track called Fault Line. There is effect like revving back or playing back um, the reel to reel. Um, I think it's just kind of experimenting, but it, it's quite short and it goes followed by The Painter. 
The painter I think is just average track and again it's not something we should dwell on too much today. It's followed by Why Didn't Rosemary? Rosemary. Um, somebody said on radio that it's Why Didn't Rosemary Take the Pill? Um, so apparently Rosemary got pregnant but now she's 70 so I don't know maybe somebody could get in touch with Rosemary but anyway um, this is quite decent track and, and um, knowing what happened afterwards I think the rhythm mm, reminds me a bit of and I can connect the dots that it's somewhat similar line of bass and rhythm like Black Knight um, later on and it's just a decent track and then it's followed by Bird Has Flown and this is really quite aggressive nice riff by Richie and this is a really good track and the whole thing is finished with April um, which is um, absolutely great track and I think John Lord plays um, he's just main character I could say about that track and we have those you know string arrangements and orchestra and this is like a like introduction to what happened afterwards with Ian Gillen first album recorded live which is con concerto for group and orchestra um, the album that was completely under control of John Lord so I think uh, and yes this is fabulous track and I don't know if it's 10-12 minutes um, but it's fabulous it's just a nice story and there's lots of instruments arrangements and it's one of the peaks of Mark I um, recording and also it's like a swan song you could call it because this is the last one on the album um, so that's how the story of Mark I ends with that um, overall I think it's just um, I'm not sure if we would be talking about the purple Mark I if there was no continuation I think there were so many um, LPs and music like that in late 60s and there's no shame it's, it's, it's actually quite good but um, it's not outstanding um, but because what happened after I think we're coming back to this and a um, couple of other things I wanted to say <coughs> that I'm in possession of Mark I live recording called the Purple Inglewood and it's been recorded in October 1968 and you can hear Hush Kentucky Woman Mandrake Root help ring that neck reverted mountain high and hey Joe on this one and um, this is the only live recording of Mark I, I, I have on CD the quality is really like bootleg bootleg and it's not uh, uh, impressive so don't expect made in Japan or stuff like that on this one but I think um, it's nice to have it and listen to that today and it's not too bad but uh, it's just nice to have something of Mark One Life because this band is, is so much um, popular and known and um, of, of live performances so even for comparison or just for if you have nothing else to do and you didn't listen to that for a couple of years it's nice to come back and just see how it was when they played those track lives um, and now some some couple of minutes for vinyl record fans let me just pull out if somebody is really um, keen on um, mark one line up I would like to recommend a band called War Horse and I have two albums this is I think this is the first one and this is followed by this one Red Sea the three issues don't you don't have to be jealous it's not first presses um, they're really not very it's folded sleeves so it's really nice to even keep something like that in my hands um, let me see if there is something really in it's, it's actually Nick Simper on basses in this band so that's why I'm, I'm just presenting that and I'll tell you what this is really great piece of work a band called War Horse and um, I would recommend that uh, apparently it didn't sell and there was no success but I think from the artistic point of view uh, War Horse was a very good band and I, I'm sure there were hundreds of bands at that time uh, late 60s early 70s that didn't just 
take off and didn't make money and stopped playing or just disbanded or whatever. But um, this is part of the story of the purple Nick Simper Warhorse. I would highly recommend that. And then I'd like to show you two pieces of vinyl which is in my collection. So I'll be only talking about the first album. This is the cover that it's known from USA and Canada. This is Canadian press and I think it's very early press. I'm not sure if it's the first one, but it's not 90s or after the year 2000 reissue. Oops, I have to be careful because I just... So the label is like that. For those who like labels, it looks a bit like um, promo, but I think it's just regular. It's a regular Canadian pressing. Uh, I remember that American Tetragrammaton pressing of the first album was, I think, silver bluish type of. And my wee treasure for today I wanted to present is this one. It's quite rare because it didn't sell well in the UK and Europe. It's the first album pressed in the UK in Great Britain. And um, it's not a perfect copy, but I am really proud of that. And for those who like early labels, Parlophone, same label as Beatles. I think this is that's how it looked. So, um, so thank you very much for your time. I would appreciate your feedback. You can press likes if you want or dislikes or whatever. I would appreciate some comments. And the only thing I'm asking is that you wouldn't cross certain barrier in terms of, I think kindness, kindness or just neutrality would be appreciated, especially that this is my first. Uh, attempt. Um, so thank you very much for watching and hopefully we'll stay in touch and I'll come back with some other um, reviews of the music I love and adore for quite a lot of time. Thank you.